Yeah, Darla showed me those words, and I have, I'd have to think they took that right from Hebrews 11. It doesn't say that, but it, man, it, it sounds much like Hebrews 11. Well, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 11, that's where we'll be this morning, and then obviously we'll spend some time in, in Joshua and Judges. Um, we're in this part of Hebrews of faith where there's just a bunch of names mentioned and then a bunch of activities and um, and it says, literally, there's not enough time in scriptures to to talk about all this. And so, it, uh, if you turn to Hebrews 11, uh, obviously starting in verse 31, we're going to talk about Rahab. But it, but if you go on to verse 32, it says, "And for what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak." Samson, Jephthah of David, Samuel of the prophets, who, were through, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in the desert and mountains, in the dens and the caves of the earth. And all these, through, though commanded through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that from apart from us they should not be made perfect. And so we get to this, this chunk in Hebrews 11, where again, we've kind of had specific people mentioned and kind of something about them, and then we just get this list of people and this list of activities and things. And so what I have done and what I've just enjoyed doing is reading through that list and basically taking the characters out that are referred to. And that's what we're going to spend the next few weeks talking about. It says that scriptures says there's not time to talk about all these heroes. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to look at the people, the stories, the situations, and the miracles that are mentioned here in verse, the verses 39 on, or 31 on. We're going to mention in these nine verses, we're going to look at these different people. Obviously not hitting every single one, um, but that's kind of my goal for the next few weeks. And so this morning, uh, we're going to talk about Rahab. We're going to talk about Gideon, and we're going to talk about Jephthah. And I'm guessing that most of you who've grown up in church, if you're new to church, you've probably never heard of those people. You probably have no idea who Rahab, Gideon, or Jephthah is. If you grew up in church, you've probably heard of all of them, but I'm guessing the only story, the only character you've probably ever talked about was Gideon, because most people don't talk about Jephthah. His story is tragic, to say the least, in Judges. And generally, the prostitutes in Rahab don't get a whole lot of, of glory either. So maybe you have. Maybe you've heard lessons on these people. I, I know I haven't. I've definitely heard about Gideon and, and the fleece and, and how he went to war with just a few three, 300 warriors and he beat this mighty army. Really, God beat the mighty army. Um, but I know I've never done a study about Barak. I've never done a study about Jephthah. I've never done a study about a lot of these people mentioned. And so that's kind of what we're going to do over the next few weeks. We're just going to take these stories and and look deeper at the characters that they're tied to. So one thing I want you guys to do this morning is I'm going to read back through that list. And in your notes, I just kind of left you some blanks. And so by faith, all these heroes, um, and I'm just going to read through the list, and I just want, man, maybe something that stood out to you, uh, maybe something that caught your attention, maybe something like, man, I, I never even thought about that. Just kind of whatever stands out to you in this list, that's for you in that blank just to write down. So this is just between you and Scripture and God, and I'm just going to kind of read through it slowly, and I just kind of want you to like write what, man, what, what stands out to you. So I'm going to start in verse 33, and I'm just going to read through this list again. Um, it says, Who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, Obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness. They became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, 
Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they may rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned and saw in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep, goats. They were destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. They lived in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves. And all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. We have to remember when we read through that list, every single activity, every single situation, every single miracle, every single story, every single person mentioned in that list is all Old Testament people. This is not the apostles. This is not the New Testament church. Yes, the New Testament church was mocked and flogged and stoned and sawn in two and killed by a sword. But this particular passage is talking about everyone before Jesus. Everyone who suffered that exact same fate because of the hope they had that Jesus was coming. They had not met Jesus. They had not talked to Jesus. They had not walked with Jesus I mean, think about that. The early church, so many of those leaders in the early church walked with Jesus. We know in Acts 2, when they were waiting on the Holy Spirit, that 120 were in the room. 120 people that had touched Jesus, that had lived with Jesus, that had felt Jesus, that that had eaten with him, that had raised him. They knew who Christ was. They knew his, his stories. They knew everything about them. But yet every single person in Hebrews 11 came in the Old Testament. And there's that huge 400 year gap between the Old Testament and New Testament. They didn't know any of this. The only thing they had to cling on to, and exactly what that song said, is hope. They hoped that Jesus, that God was going to do everything he said he was going to do. They believed in that hope. They held on to that hope. And for that hope, they lost their lives. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were mocked. They were made fun of. They stopped lying, lion's mouth. They quenched fire. They obtained promises. All of that based on hope. Hope that God was exactly who he said he would be. Now for me, that just blows me away when I think about that. Like the early church is is phenomenal, but I'm like, but they actually got to be with Jesus. These people didn't even know what Jesus was. They only knew that a Messiah was coming, that a good shepherd was coming, that this perfecter of the faith was coming. They had all these prophecies, but they didn't even have a name for him. They just knew there was a future, and they put their hope in that. And so that's why I want to spend time looking at some of these characters over the next through weeks, through few weeks, sorry. And they realized and they understood at the very end of this that God had something better for them, right? Verse 39, they did not receive what was promised. In other words, they didn't get to live with the Messiah. They didn't get to understand it all. They did not get to receive what was promised. They had to hope that that promise would actually happen. The same way that we hope that Christ will return again and we believe that promise because God has been faithful in every promise. But they did not receive what was promised, but God had provided something better for us. He provided heaven. He provided this end game, this end goal, right? And he said that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. In other words, they're waiting for perfection. They're waiting for heaven just like we're waiting for it. They're still waiting wherever they are If it's the current heaven, if it's paradise, they're still waiting for the end time to come. When God creates this new heaven and this new earth, and that everything is made whole and made perfect, they're waiting on that just like we are. And Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah, people that we're going to look at over the next few weeks, they got a glimpse of this. Ezekiel got taken away in a vision, and Daniel got to see a vision. They saw a little glimpse of what this would look like. Ezekiel saw all kinds of crazy things that he couldn't even put into words if you've read through the book of Ezekiel. They got prophecies, they got promises, but they only got a glimpse of the future promises. We, as a church, get a whole lot bigger glimpse of the future promises because we have the words of Jesus. We have the whole New Testament. We have his whole life. We have everything he did, but it's still only a glimpse of what's to come. It's still only a glimpse of what's to come. 
And all of this was made perfect in the work of Christ. That's not by accident that in Hebrews 10, it talks about the Christ is a sacrifice for all, right? So as, as the author of Hebrews is writing this book, he says, hey, in chapter 10, he spends all about Christ is the sacrifice for all. And chapter 11 is all these heroes of faith that followed that example, even though they hadn't even seen it. And then chapter 12 is Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith, reminding us that it's nothing we do, it's nothing we can do, because we need that founder and protector of our faith. But by faith, every single person, either specifically mentioned or referred to, led a different way of life and had a different way of their actions. By faith, which led to a different way of life and actions, is what I put in your notes. These people lived differently. Samson, Jephthah, Gideon, Rahab, David, Samuel, Daniel, Oh, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elisha, uh, Elijah, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all of those guys, some of those people that you know from Bible stories are all in these verses, right? If I say, man, they quenched fire, you're instantly probably going to think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. If I think shutting the mouth of a lion, you think of Daniel in the lion's den. If you think of women receiving back their dead, both Elisha and Elijah gave back a widow their dead child, right? These, these, these prophets, they walked around, they hung out in dens, they lived in caves, they walked in goat's skins, Historically, we, we know historically from the church that both Isaiah and Jeremiah were sawed in two by the nation of Israel when the nations went into captivity and they got tired of the prophets and their words. So again, we're going to look at these guys um, over the next few weeks. Their faith led them to live a different way of life and actions, which is why I put in your notes, and I think it'll be on the screen, that, man, this is why uh, faith, which is why James 1 and 2 are so important, right? James 1, 19 through 23, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of men does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word, and not hearers, only deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror and then quickly forgets what he looks like. Or, or James 2, 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers, if someone has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If their brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of, one of you says to them, go in peace and be warm and filled without giving them a thing needed for the body, what good is that? So also, by faith itself, it does, it does not, wow, if it does not have works, is dead. That's exactly what this passage of Hebrews is all about. These people lived a different life, and their faith and their works worked together for this future hope. And we see that all throughout the, old, or the New Testament. And the whole book of James talks so much about that. Man, your faith and your works, they work hand in hand. They work together. Your life is going to look different. And so that's kind of where we'll be heading over the next few weeks. There's, there isn't any more verses specifically about Moses or Abraham or what they did, but there's all these little stories that we're going to go back into the Old Testament and pick apart. Um, and so that's where we're heading. So with that being said, turn to Joshua 2. We're going to start with Rahab. And she's the last one mentioned specifically in this list. It says, by faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. You know, I looked up Rahab in, in scriptures, uh, throughout all of scriptures, and it's interesting. Every single time Rahab's name is mentioned, it's mentioned as Rahab, the prostitute. Every single time she's mentioned as Rahab, the prostitute. And, I, and I, I, I thought that was interesting. I was like, so she never shed that? She never got away from that? What, what's going on? That was her label. And, and so there are a couple things that that told me. As, first off, that Rahab was a sinner, right? But it wasn't just like she needed to repent from sin. Like, she chose that life. Her job was sin. And she chose that sin. And so she was a Gentile, and she was a sinner. And everywhere throughout scriptures, even in the genealogy in Matthew, it says Rahab the prostitute. She never got away from that title. 
but yet she's in the genealogy of David and Matthew. If you want to do the math, if you want to impress a Bible teacher, um, Rahab would be the great, great, great grandmother of David. And so Rahab would have given birth to um, oh, shoot, Boaz. And if you know the story of Ruth and you've read the book of Ruth, Boaz married a foreign woman, Ruth. And Boaz and Ruth gave birth to Obed. And Obed gave birth to Jesse. And Jesse gave birth to David. I don't think it's coincidence that Boaz ended up marrying a foreigner, a woman who was not an Israelite, a woman who would have been mistreated, a woman who was a misfit, because that was his mother, Rahab the prostitute. So we get to Joshua chapter 2, and it says in scriptures that Rahab was saved, Rahab the prostitute was saved by faith. Why? Because she hid these spies, and she had given a friendly welcome to them. She did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome. And so I went back to Joshua and I read this. And so these, these two guys, Joshua sends two guys out to spy the land. They're going to take over Jericho. Uh, they haven't gotten the battle plan yet at this point in time. It's after this. We talked about last week where the angel appears to Joshua and tells them to march. So they just go and spy it out. And they come into the town, right? Well, when you want to know something about a town, if you've ever moved or you've ever gone to a new place, there's a few places you can go to find out about a town. The local barber shop is a great place to start because every guy will be hanging out there all morning long gossiping about everything going on. Okay? The local restaurant, if the town's small enough. I loved when I first moved here going to Old Cedar because I found out everything going on in town. Because everyone hangs out and talks about it. So the local coffee shop, the restaurant, the barber shop, the local tavern will be a place you can find things out. Well, in this day and age, if you were heading into town and you were a foreigner and you wanted to kind of stay hidden and no one wanted to notice you, where are you going to go? Well, the brothel, right? Because traveling men would have come into town and went straight to the prostitute. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's good, but it makes logical good sense. These guys didn't want to be noticed, they were spies, they didn't want anyone to know they were, so they went where all traveling men would go. They went to the brothel, they went to Rahab, they found out where she lived, and they went there. Because they could lay low and no one would think anything about two traveling men walking in to, to that situation. I'm sorry for those of you who are going to have to explain what that word is to your kids later on. But, it's all over scriptures. Bible is X-rated, if you haven't figured that out. Before the men lay down, so, so the people, they've come there, they're laying low, they're hanging out there, that's where all traveling guys would have went, it makes sense, no one's going to think anything of it, but guys, they figured out these two guys were not from around there. So these men come and they question Rahab, they're like, hey, two guys came to you, what's going on? We know they're Israelites, we know something's up, they've been demolishing every nation, we're a little bit nervous, where are they? And she's like, oh, they already left. Man, before you close the city gates, they came here, they did their thing, they left. Uh, if you pursue them quickly, if you go quickly, you might be able to catch up with them. So she feeds them a line. She lies to these men. She lies to the investigators, the police, whoever they were. She says, they've already gone. So it says the men pursued them the way of the Jordan, and as soon as these guys left, the gates are shut. So back then, at nighttime, the gates shut, you're stuck in town all night long. You didn't get to go wander around the countryside. You stayed inside the walls. It says, before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, this is verse 8 of Joshua 2, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of this land melt away before you. For we have heard of how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan, to Shine and to Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is the God in heaven and above the earth, above and on, I'm sorry, he is the God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. And then please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you will also deal kindly with my father's house. Give me a sure sign that you will save, that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brothers, and my sisters, and all belonging to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then the Lord, then when the Lord gives us this land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she lets them down by a window. So they escape into the night, and they go back and they give the report that guys, we got this. Everyone is scared of us. 
So a couple things that we can learn from Rahab is obviously she was a Gentile. She was a sinner. She was living in sin. That was her lifestyle. It wasn't like she was just like, you know, struggling and repenting. Like she was going, no, nope, this is what I'm going to do. We're all sinners. But she was choosing to live outside of, of the plan. Ultimately, though, she saw that God had a plan and wanted to be a part of it. She recognized. Now, whether at first this was just to save her own skin or not, we don't know. But she recognized that God had a plan and she wanted to be a part of it. She didn't get where she was at by having the number one business in Jericho by being stupid. She was smart. She was probably ruthless. She had sent these other guys away. She knew what she was doing. She knew how to make money. And she saw an advantage and she took it. She saw that God had a plan and she recognized it didn't include Jericho. And she said, I'm out of here. I'm bailing. I'm jumping on that ship. Now, again, we don't know when she converted, but we clearly know at some point in time she became a believer of God because she's in the genealogy. You can't become a believer and get married to a Jew without becoming Jewish. So for the very fact that she married Boaz's father, she somewhere along the line became Jewish, gave up her lifestyle, and committed to the faith. Because that's the only way you can get married. You, you can't become Jewish without, be, you can't get married to a Jew without becoming Jewish. And that has not changed. Even today, if you want to marry a Jewish person, you have to claim that you're converting to Judaism. Now, it's a farce and it doesn't really happen. Um, but the same thing is true of Lutherans and Catholics. I remember when a good friend of mine uh, married a Catholic girl, he had to denounce his Lutheran faith and become Catholic so they could get married. Now, did he really become Catholic? No. But did he go through the dog and pony show? Yes. But back here, like, there was no dog and pony show. So Rahab, somewhere along the line, became a believer and became, or at least a believer of who God was. But at this point in time, she saw that God had a plan and wanted to be a part of it. So I don't know when she converted, but for the fact that she's included over and over in scriptures and a part of the genealogy of David and Jesus lets us know that eventually she believed God was who he said he was. She saw that God had a plan to be a part of it. She recognized that the God she was serving was not the Lord of heavens. I underlined that in my Bible in verse 11. She said, as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. There was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, she uses the exact right verbiage for the Lord, their God. She uses the verbiage that would be Jehovah Jireh, I am. She doesn't use God. She doesn't say your God. Like, because they all worshiped gods, right? Every single person in this time period worshiped God. I mean, the Egyptians had hundreds of them. There would be the God of the sun, the God of the harvest, the God of the water, the God of the fish, everything. It was not uncommon to worship a God. But she recognizes that their, their God is a holy God, that he is above all the other gods. And she uses the right verbiage. She says, the Lord your God. That's the way that, G, that the Lord is referred to all through the Pentateuch. The Lord your God, or I am, Jehovah. She said, the Lord your God, he is the God in heaven, above and on the earth beneath. So all these little demigods that they worshipped for their harvest and for their rains and for everything, she recognizes that this God is above all of them. He's better. He's more unique. Again, this has not changed in the world. This was the hardest thing that we battled in West Africa because everyone in West Africa is spiritual. And everyone in West Africa believes God exists, believes Satan exists, believes demons exist. It's getting them to understand that the Jesus is the ultimate Savior. And ultimately what happens in, in so many countries, in, in Africa, and in Asia, and so many places, is that these religious cultures, well, of course they're going to say they believe in God, because if this God is better than their God, then they want the one better. And so then as a missionary, you have to like walk through that, like, do they actually believe who God is? Do they actually understand salvation? Or are they just trying to make sure they've picked the right God? And right now, that's exactly what Rahab's doing. She recognizes that her God isn't as powerful as Israel's God, and she wants to make sure she's on the winning team and pick the right God. That has not changed in 2020. There are cultures, if you go as a missionary, you're going to experience that exact same thing. When you say, well, you do believe there are God. Well, yeah, I believe there's a God. That's who created all this. Well, do you want God to be a part of your life? Of course I want God to be a part of my life. 
I, I want to be on the right time, side. But then you start digging into this relationship, and it's like, well, no, I'm not, I'm not going to walk away from when I'm worshiping. I'm not going to walk away from when I'm serving. I'm still going to go to my witch doctor, but I also believe in God, too, because he's clearly a little bit stronger. But, you know, some days he may take a day off, and the witch doctor may be stronger. Those, those principles, those concepts have, are still alive today. And you will walk through them if, if, depending on what countries you visit and what countries maybe God calls you to work in. So she recognized that she, the God she was serving was not the Lord of heavens. But ultimately, what we see in the Old Testament, what we see in, in, with Rahab, is that we see in the Old Testament God was for everyone, not just the Jews. Right? And the Jews never got that. The Jews never fully understood that God was for everyone. They always thought that God was for them and them alone. And that's why Paul and Peter and Apollos fought so much in the Old Testament. Because the Jews would say, you have to become like us. And Paul would say, no, you don't. And they say, you have to get circumcised and do all this. And Paul would say, no, you don't. The Jewish people never fully understood that God's plan was not for them and them alone. God's plan is to redeem the world. And so we see this early on in scriptures. And we've seen it other places too. The Old Testament, God's plan was for everyone, not just a Jew. And the boundary was not ethic. It was complete allegiance to God. In other words, as you continue, if you've already read through Joshua and Judges in your daily reading or you're doing it right now, as you continue to read, you're going to see other people that are saved. They're not Jewish people. It has nothing to do with their ethnic background. It has nothing to do with their color, their race, their language. What The only thing that matters to God is that your allegiance to God and God alone. That is what God is trying to teach them. And so the way that he set up the whole Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the whole law was set up to, you're going to live life different than every other nation because you're going to be allegiant to me, you're going to count on me, you're going to count on me for everything, and I'm going to be your provider. Even when it comes to these battles, I'm going to keep winning them for you. What I want is your heart. I want your allegiance. And what Israel fought, the rest of Joshua, Judges, and Samuel, is they wanted to be allegiant to a king. They wanted to be allegiant to the world. They didn't want to be allegiant to God. They didn't want to be like, they didn't want to be different. They wanted to be like everyone else. And so we see right away in the story of Rahab that God was for everyone, not just the Jews. He saves Rahab. He saves her family. She becomes a part of the greatest genealogy in scriptures. She's the great-grandmother times three of David, is in the line of Jesus, her, her granddaughter would have been Ruth, and she's right there in the middle of it because the boundary is not ethnic. It was complete allegiance to God, and that has not changed. Christianity, obeying the Lord, is not for just Americans. It's not just for white people. It's not just for people that grew up in Christian homes. It is for everybody. God wants everybody to come home to be reconciled, to come be a part of him. And so that's why we sing, God loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. You know, every single person out there, every background, every nationality, every tongue, every nation, they're all going to be represented in heaven. Every single one. And God is showing us this picture right here. Heroes of the faith realize their sin they repent and pledge their allegiance to the Lord and the Lord alone. That's ultimately what I think we've learned from Rahab. Rahab realized she needed something. Rahab realized she was a sinner. Along the way, and we don't know that part of the story, she repented and became a part of Israel. So ultimately, heroes of the faith, we realize we're sinners. We realize we need Jesus. We realize we can't do it on our own. We repent and we pledge our allegiance to the Lord and the Lord alone. God, we're on your team. We're all in. You've got all of us. What do you need us to do? Where do you need us to go? Who do you need us to talk to? We're yours, God. Use us as a vessel, as a tool. To me, that's what we learn from Rahab. Now, you might study it and come up with something different, and that's okay, because the point of this is to get you in Scripture, hopefully studying people you have never studied before, and yet are mentioned in Hebrews 11 as being heroes of the faith. Heroes of the faith realize their sin, repent, and pledge their allegiance to the Lord and the Lord alone. Now we completely shift gears, and we go into Judges. And the next two guys that we're going to look at this morning are Gideon and Jepheth. And I don't know if I'm saying his name right. That's just how I've always pronounced it. Um, but these two guys, um, their mistakes are clear in Scripture. Their mistakes are pointed out in Scripture. 
These guys, when I read these guys and I read their stories, I don't see hero here. I see screw-ups. I see mess-ups. And honestly, it gives me hope. Because I'm like, man, if these guys made the list in Hebrews 11, then there's still hope for me. These guys were full of mistakes, and it was pointed out in scriptures. Yet God used both of these men to conquer nations, and Gideon specifically was made strong in his weakness. And so two of those phrases that we saw in Hebrews, he said he will use them to conquer nations, conquer kingdoms. They were made strong in their weaknesses. We see that in both Gideon and Japheth. Both of them conquered nations. And Gideon specifically was made strong in his weakness. So I put in your notes, as disciples, we don't have to be perfect to be used by God. This idea that we have to have it all together and be perfect to be used by God is hogwash that somewhere along the way we made up to make ourselves feel better, I guess. I don't, I don't know. We don't have to be perfect to be used by God. But we should always strive, but we should strive to always be transforming. And I wanted to throw that in there because this doesn't just give us an excuse to do whatever we want. That, it's not a get out of jail free card. We should be striving to be transforming. We should be asking God to speak into our life and change us and transform us. But we don't have to be perfect to be used by God. In fact, a lot of times I think we're used in our weaknesses. The things that we're not strong about. And so you get, and, and I wanted to read this from you. This is the last, last verse in my, my study Bible about the book of Judges. And that just sums up the whole book. And before we look at Gideon specifically, I just want you guys to hear this. It said, all servants of God's purpose, all servants of God's purposes for his people have their flaws. They question, the question is whether God should choose to allow those flaws to, be, to bear their bitter fruit. Even in these circumstances, God is working out his plan. He is not thwarted even by human failure. So all servants of God's purposes for his people have their flaws. We all have flaws. The question is whether God should choose to allow these flaws to bear their bitter fruit. And even if they do, even if they do bear their bitter fruit, even in these circumstances, God is working out his plan, and he is not thwarted by human failure. Man, so if you're like, man, I have screwed up, Mike. You don't know my story. You don't know my life. I am a failure. I have bitter fruit. God could never use me. I'm saying, no, he can use you. He does use you because his plan will never be thwarted. He wants to use you. Now, there may be some repenting you need to do. There may be some cleaning up, some things you need to do, some things you need to walk away from. But God will continue to work out his plan. You cannot stop his plan. So why not be a part of the plan instead of just being a bystander or, 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 or bowing out altogether? In the end of the book of, of Judges, it says, The book of Judges arose in apostate condition of the time. It was written as a justification of the monarchy since the final verdict of the book. In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did at what he saw fit in his own eyes. Implies that things would have been different if there had been a godly king leading the nation, and they would have done right in God's eyes. And again, the book of Judges goes right into Samuel where you begin to see that with David being that godly king, doing things right in his own eyes. But the book of Judges ends with this, this phrase, everyone did as he saw fit. And in a way, I, I feel like that's kind of what's happening in our own country. I feel like more and more I just see people just doing as they see fit, especially on the church front. We're reliving the book of Judges in some ways. So Gideon, if you've never heard the story of Gideon, Gideon basically, uh, it picks up in Judges chapter 6, and, and we're not going to read it all, but Gideon is, is a young man, uh, he's scared, he doesn't have a lot of strength, he's not real confident, and he basically, this angel of the Lord comes to him under the tree, uh, which belongs to Joash, and tells us all these people where it belongs, and Gideon was there, he's beaten, he's beaten wheat in a wine press, right? So Israel's under oppression of the Midianites. They're having to hide their work. So instead of making wine, he's in a wine press beating wheat, hiding, so the Midianites don't come and steal his food. And it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all these wonderful deeds that our fathers recount to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring you up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us, this, given us into the hand of Midian. So in other words, Gideon's a down, Debbie Downer. He's like, what are you talking about? If God is so good, then where is he? We're suffering. We're slaves. Midian has us. You guys, my dads, my grandparents, they tell me all these mighty stories. I sure don't see them. I haven't seen them in my whole lifetime. What are you talking about? Who is this God and where is he? How can he be for us if everything is against us, is essentially what Gideon's saying. 
And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? So he goes, first he goes, God, you've forsaken us. You've forgotten about us. We're slaves. And then he goes, Okay, but I'm going to use you. Even though you're a Debbie Downer, even though you're being a whiner baby right now, I'm going to use you and you're going to go lead the Israel's army against Midian. And Gideon's like, Are you kidding me? What? He said, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord has said to him, I will be with you and shall strike the Midians as one man. So he's like, he's like, Gideon, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to prove to you all these stories your dad's heard told, tell you about all your house, what they talk about. I'm going to prove it to you. Gideon's not believing it. He's not buying a word of it. He's like, I don't think so. I'm like the weakest. Notice that this parallel is the exact same story as Saul. Right? When God called Saul, he was hiding in the luggage because he was of the smallest clan of Benjamin, of the weakest clan of Benjamin, and Saul was trying to hide in the luggage, but Saul was a very, very tall man, and so he couldn't even hide in the luggage. It'd be like if Seth like, tried to hide under these... Sorry, I, you're just so tall, you make a great example. But like, at six foot six, Seth can only hide so many places, right? We're going to see him. The same thing happened with Saul. He tried to hide, and they're like, oh, yeah, there's that head over there. Yeah, that, that's Saul. I'm sure as Seth was growing up, he tried to play hide-and-seek from his parents or his brothers. Or sis- his brothers. He didn't have sisters. They're probably like, oh, there's, there, we can see his head. There's, there's Seth. Were you a good hider, Seth? Too tall? Yeah, yeah. That's what I figured. So please, Lord, he said, he said please, Lord, if I found favor in your eyes... And show me a sign that will speak to me. Do not depart from me. So he's like, Gideon's like, all right, well, I'm not sure I buy into this. I need a sign. So he goes home and he prepares this meal and he has this whole conversation with God. God gives him a sign. It's probably not the Bible story that you're familiar with, but he gives him a sign. Uh, he puts, smites the, the whole thing. Uh, he, uh, he built his altar. And basically, the blows of the whole altar burns up. The, the sacrifice goes away. And the Lord says, hey, you need to go destroy the, the altar of Baal in town. So Gideon gets up in the middle of the night uh, with a few friends. They destroy the, ball, the altar in the morning. Obviously, the whole town's upset because their church was destroyed. How are they going to worship to Baal? They want to get rid of Gideon. They're mad. They step in. They said, no. Nope. Gideon's like, no, no, no. God told me to do this. We're going to go attack the Midianites. So everyone's like, all right. Well, if you're going to get us out of slavery, we'll listen. This is probably this part of the story you're familiar with. And so picking up in Judges 6.36, the sign of the fleece. The Gideon said to God, I will save Israel by my hands as you have said. Behold, I'm laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry all around the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning, he squeezed the fleece and there was enough, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl of water. So the fleece was wet and the ground around him was dry. But it wasn't enough for Gideon. He's like, ah, I got to need to test you one more time. He said, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test you once more with this fleece. He said, please let it be dry on the fleece only and on the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. And so the fleece, there was dry on the fleece only and all the ground there was dew. So this is the third time now that Gideon has tested God. And the rest of the story, Gideon goes... They have 22,000 men, then 10,000 men remain, then God does this weird test where they've got to drink water, uh, either lapping it with their hands or lapping it with their tongues. Based on that, they get down to 300 guys. So they're going to go fight this army with 300 guys. They've got a trumpet, they've got a torch, and they've got a bowl. Not exactly your most best battle plan, but they go into battle, they break their bowls, they shout their trumpets, they light their, their torches, and the whole army just thinks they're surrounded, and it says they all killed each other, and the, the men just stabbed, stood back and watched, and they went in, chased the few remaining guys, and took all the plunder. That's the abridged version of Gideon. So what can we learn from Gideon? Well, first off, Gideon started off as a great judge, but he was led astray later in life, much like Solomon. So Gideon started off as a great judge. He called for, he was the only judge in the whole book of Judges, he's the only judge that called for religious reform. I thought that was very interesting as I studied it this week. The only judge that actually called the nation to repent and return to God was Gideon. Yet he's the one that led them astray in the end. 
So he starts off good, but just like Solomon, he builds this ephod, which becomes an altar, which everyone starts worshiping at, the same way that Solomon was led astray at the later his life by all his wives, and he built altars, and people started worshiping. So he starts off good, but he gets led astray. He's the only judge, the only judge that called the nation to repentance. The rest of the judges in the book, they free the people, they, they, they battle armies, but no one else calls the nation to repentance. He was, immediate, he was immediately obedient. I mean, he tested God, he asked God, but then he broke down the, the altar and he went to war. He was scared and unsure, asking God for a sign twice. It really, I really should have put it in three times. He was scared and unsure, asking God for a sign. In other words, Gideon's like, I, I don't know about this. And I think a lot of us can relate to that, right? A lot of us, God sometimes asks us to do something and we're scared and unsure. We're like, I don't really know. I'm not really sure. And I, and I, and I, I put that in your notes because I want you to see it's okay to be scared and unsure. It's okay. In fact, I think it's okay to ask God questions. I think it's okay to ask God for a sign. But when God answers and gives you that sign, then you better get on the obedient side of things. I don't think it's wrong to be unsure and scared. There have been times in my life where I was definitely scared and unsure. There's times in my life I've asked God for signs. There's times in my life where we've put out fleeces. But as soon as God responded, then we acted upon that. And I think that's the difference is when, when you do do that and, and God gives you the answer, then you need to act upon it and not just stay in that moment of scared and unsureness. So he was scared and unsure, asking God for a sign. He led a battle with 300 men and watched God deliver a nation. Despite Gideon's failure, God is always working on his plan and will never be thwarted by men. And we talked about that already when we started the book. Even in Gideon's failure, God was still working in him and through him, and his plan still happened. And so, again, just summarize the life of Gideon. Heroes of the faith, at times, ask God for a sign of confirmation. I, I think it's okay to ask God for a sign of confirmation. I think it's okay to ask people to join you in prayer and fasting when you think God is, is calling you or maybe moving you to something else. And again, I think the difference is, and we see this in Gideon, is when you get that sign, then you go and you're obedient. Instead of going, well, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Well, it'll be really hard. And you literally talk yourself out of it. I think it's okay to ask God for a sign of confirmation. And we see that throughout the New Testament with other people as well. So that's what we can learn from Gideon. And now the last guy, Jephthah. And uh, you can turn over to Judges chapter 11. I'm betting this is not a judge you've ever spent any time looking at. Um, he was a mighty warrior. As scripture tells us, he was a mighty warrior. He was the son of a prostitute. Uh, his dad had went, out, went away from his wife and, and went with this lady and had this, this Jephthah. Uh, so um, his, his brothers didn't like him. His family didn't like him. He was the illegitimate son. He was kicked out of the home. He was kicked out of the town. He was kicked out of the village. Uh, and it says that he went in verse 3 of chapter 11. It said he fled from his brothers and he lived in the land of Tob. And worthless followers collected around Jebeth and they went out with him. And so, um, and, then that, and, and so basically what happens is, so he's, he's the illegitimate child. He's kicked out of home, town, everything. He's living in a foreign a nation. And the Israel, again, becomes under confliction from the Ammonites this time. And this guy, he's ultimately, what, what ultimately, and I, and I put it in your notes, he's ultimately a mercenary. Jephthah has become this mighty warrior. He's a mercenary. He sells his services. And so the people reach out to him, the same people that had rejected him and kicked him out and say, hey, would you come back and deliver us? Would you free us? And he's like, Sure but on these conditions. And he says, if I'm going to free you, then I'm going to be ruler. And so they basically have this negotiation, and that's what verses 1 through 11 are. And they have this negotiation, and they say, yep, if you win, the Lord be our witness, we will put you leader over us. So he's like, all right, I'm in. He sends a message to, to the to Ammonite king. He gets, he gets shot down. He's like, all right, we're going to go to battle. And he makes this stupid, stupid, stupid vow. It says, the spirit of the Lord came upon him, the same language that we see with Samson. So the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, even though he wasn't necessarily the smartest tool in the shed. He passed through Ganelia and Manassas. He passed through, and he made this vow, and he says, if you give me the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So he is so, he has so much zeal, he has so much zest, he just talks before he thinks, and he says, Lord, whatever exits my house, the very first thing, I'm, I'm killing it, and it's yours. 
That's the vow he makes. Fast forward, he wins the battle, no problem. The Lord gives him, uh, the, gives the people into his hand, and the first person that comes out of the house, well, what do you think is going to be? It's a family member. He's returned from war. He's a glorious warrior. He's a glorious king. And his daughter comes out. His only daughter. He had one child. He had no other sons, no other daughters. And she comes out with tambourines and she's dancing because she's excited that dad has freed the people. And he's just, I mean, it says, as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low and have become the cause of great trouble for me. For I opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot take back my vow. So he allows her to go and mourn for two months into the, the mountains, comes back, fulfills his vow, and to this day, well, in the New Testament time, the people of Israel still spent time celebrating this tradition of, of sending the young women out into the hills. In fact, Isaiah and Jeremiah use that even as prophecies towards the end times with, with revelations. So Jephthah, he's this interesting judge and a couple things that we can learn from him is he hung out with a worthless crowd, okay? And I know some of you are going, but, but Mike, David hung out with a worthless crowd. But the difference between Jephthah and David is David was a leader. And if you go back and you read Samuel, the people that came to David weren't necessarily worthless. They were just leaderless. And David led them, and he led them into be mighty men. He led them to be warriors, and they became the leaders of the country. This guy just hung out with a worthless crowd, in fact, the, the, the verb that's used about him in, in Greek would be, basically, he was a scoundrel. He was a scoundrel. So I, I said he hung out with the worthless crowd. He was a mercenary. He didn't really have a lot of character. He wasn't your typical judge as you see him. He was the only judge in the book of Judges not appointed by God. Jephthah, if you reread the story of Judges 11 and 10, he was never appointed by God. He was appointed by man. The same way that man claimed and cried out for a king in Saul, and they got Saul, and then God eventually appointed David. So Jephthah was the only judge, not appointed by God, but by man. Yet, like Samson, God used him, and his spirit fell upon him. So even though he wasn't appointed by God, God still used Jephthah, and despite of his weakness, despite of his character traits, it says the spirit fell upon him, the spirit was with him, and he freed his people. He freed the Israelites who were suffering. And he makes this tragic vow, which cost him everything that was dear to him. He makes a tragic vow, which cost him everything that was dear to him. He continues to lead for a few more years. Uh, his, his life was very short. Uh, he only led Israel six years. And then, then there's a list of these new judges before you get to Samson. And so kind of as I look at the story of Jephthah, and, and again, we've already talked about that God will use us to spite ourselves. God will use us in our weaknesses. God uses everyone. I mean, Jephthah, he wasn't like a character role model. He's not someone that we want to, we, we're probably never going to name our kids after this guy. Uh, he's not something you necessarily want your kids to be like. But the one thing that I loved about him is he had a zeal. And I, and I wrote in, in your notes, heroes of the faith had a zeal for the Lord. But be careful with your tongue and your zeal. He had this zeal, and he had this passion, and he's like, God, I'm going to give you exactly everything in honor if you give me this battle. He had this zeal that, that came over him. In other words, he wanted God to get the glory, but he didn't necessarily think through what he said. And I think we should have that same zeal for the Lord. I, I think that zeal is good. We should have a zeal to want to serve God, to want to honor God, to go and do whatever God is asking us to do. But in our zeal, be careful with your tongue. Right? And we already read it. I'll, I'll read it to you guys again back, back in James 1. Right? Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Right? And James talks so much about the tongue. And so I think we can learn from Jephthah to have zeal for the Lord, to have zeal for our faith, to have zeal for serving Him. But be careful with that zeal. Be careful with our tongue. Think through what we're going to say. Think through how we're going to say it to people. Because sometimes in our zeal we hurt people. Sometimes in our zeal we put people down, or sometimes in our zeal we make a vow that is tragic or something we could never, ever actually do, like in this case. Now, he followed through with his vow. I don't know that I would have um, sacrificed my own child, but again, he had this zeal for the Lord. 
And so I encourage us to have that zeal, but to be careful with our tongues. Our tongue is the most powerful weapon we have. So again, these, these, these the people that we looked at this morning, they're, they're not exactly what we consider heroes. They definitely wouldn't be heroes defined by the American culture. They're not going to be people that we're going to idolize, whatever. But yet Jesus saw something in them. And he, he saw character traits in them. And he used them. And he mentions them. And the author of Hebrews mentions them. And he says these people were still used by God. They still believed in God's promises despite their iniquities, despite their faults, despite their character traits, despite where they fell down. They were still a part of God's family. And to me, like I already said, that brings hope. I don't have to be perfect. I can make mistakes. I will make mistakes. I don't have to be the Davids of the world. It's okay to stumble and get, get back up and repent and continue to run towards God. When I'm unsure or not, or not know what's going on, I know that God will still use me in spite of that. And so I hope that encourages you this morning that it's okay to not always be the hero every time. It's okay to do things differently. It's okay to ask God for confirmation but yet also recognize when you need to repent and run back to him. And it's good to have zeal for the Lord, but in our zeal, be careful with our lips. And I think if we've learned anything over the last few years, the, the biggest place that people are not quick to listen and slow to speak is on social media. And it breaks my heart, the amount of zeal that's used on social media that just tears people down. And so have zeal for the Lord, but yet be careful with your tongue. Be careful where you use that. Be careful what you say. So I, I, again, not, nothing grand to take home, but just these three principles. Having zeal, asking God uh, you know, for confirmation, and realizing our sin, and realizing that no matter where you're at on that spectrum, God will use you just like he used Rahab, just like he used Gideon, and just like he used Jepheth. So I'm going to pray, and then Forrest is going to come up and just read a, a story from, from uh, Jesus Freaks to just close our time this morning. God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for these, these three Bible characters that were so important to you that you put them in Hebrews 11. That despite their faults, despite their weaknesses, you used them, and they were obedient to you, and they served you amidst their tragedies at times. God, it lets us know that we don't have to come before you perfect. We don't have to have it all figured out. We just have to come before you to repent and to recognize that we need you in our life. God, even if we're scared and unsure, it's okay to ask questions and ask you to confirm what you might be leading us to. And Lord, when we get excited about what you might be leading us to, it's okay to have zeal. It's okay to be excited. It's okay to be all in. But yet, help us to be careful with that zeal to not hurt others, to not damage others, to not tear others down in our own excitement. But at the end of the day, we just want to honor you. We want to serve you. And Lord, these, these stories give me hope that you'll continue to use all of us in this, this room, in this church, because none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. A lot of us are scared and unsure, and a lot of us don't exactly know what you may be doing. But God, we know that we can honor you and serve you, and you will lead us and you will guide us in our homes, in our communities, in our workplaces. And that, Lord, if we open ourselves up to you, you will give us that zeal to be heroes of the faith right now in 2020, in August, exactly where you have us, despite where we might fall short. And Lord, for that promise and for that hope, I am eternally grateful that these people are included in this list, that I don't have to be a David or a Jeremiah or an Isaiah. I don't have to be these people that we consider almost perfect in their faith with maybe one or two blemishes. Lord, that I can be who I am and let you transform me every single day. And I thank you for that promise for all of us. In your name we pray. Amen.